All right, everyone. Welcome to our fourth and final uh, session of the Wildlife Study Group, brought to you by the Environmental Reporting Collective. Uh, right now, before we get into the actual discussion, we like to do a series of polls just to get everybody warmed up, uh, and also for us to get to know you a bit better. Our first question: Sapal, are you ready? What do you work as? Do you work in conservation? Are you a, just a nature lover that decided to join us? A student? A journalist? Or you are in traditional Chinese medicine, given today's topic. I'll give you guys five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Most people in wildlife conservation, we have a fair number of journalists and people who just love nature. I'm, I'm thinking the person, the two percent who said they practice or study or teach traditional Chinese medicine, that's probably Dr. Kong, one of our experts, right? Can't do the math that quickly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Second question. Yeah. Um, I use traditional medicine because uh, no, I use traditional medicine whether it's all the time, sometimes, as a last resort, or you've never used it before. This should be a fairly easy question to answer. We'll give you guys five, four, three, two, and one. What's the answer here? And the majority have never used it before. Okay, but there's a good 36% who's, who, who've used TCM before as well. Okay, yeah. Cool. Have cool. you Last used it before, Ian? Come again? Have you used it before? I've had it used on me before. Oh, okay. That happens. Like, like, like my grandma, like for my asthma, my grandma used to give me some stuff. Right. Okay, and the third <laughs> question is... All right. How do you feel about the way traditional Chinese medicine is regulated? So number one, TCM should be banned completely. Number two, TCM should be allowed, but we need stronger regulations on wildlife parts being used. Number three, the existing regulations are, are good enough. So we'll give five, four, three, two, one. What do we have? Okay, everybody seems to think, uh, yeah, we just need stronger rules against wildlife parts. Very cool. Thank you so much for participating in that poll. It's going to be very helpful for us as we go along with this discussion. So let's dive right in. Um, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, known as TCM, is known to drive demand for illegal wildlife. That's because some TCM recipes contain ingredients that are made from endangered wildlife. For example, pangolin scales, uh, as they are believed to have medicinal value. Uh, unfortunately, critics say this is what is driving consumer demand for these, these very ingredients. Uh, but with TCM uh, very much a part of Chinese culture, obviously that makes things a bit more complicated. And to just give you a bit of a perspective on how much of a part it is in Chinese culture, we're going to show you a clip from a lifestyle TV program that aired in 2016 on a TV station in China. Check out this video. Okay, so that should give you a rough idea on how, uh, what, what the public perception is like about um, pangolin scales and the, the use in TCM in China. And just so you know, uh, the pangolin is critically endangered. Uh, it is the, known as the world's most trafficked mammal, precisely because of uh, the demand for its scales. So, clearly this is a conversation that is about age-old traditions versus con conservation. And to help move our con con conversations for it, we have a few experts, including a qualified TCM doctor, Dr. Kong, who is with us, and he's going to be speaking in a while. He's also a medical doctor, so that should give us a pretty unique uh, perspective. But first, we would like to highlight the work of two incredible investigative journalists who worked on the ERC's uh, Global Pangolin Trafficking Story last year. I'd like you to help me, join me in welcoming Zhu Jiamin and Karen Zhang. Can you two please introduce yourselves and take it away? Thank you, Ian. I'm Jiamin. I'm a reporter from China. Uh, I will, I'm very glad to share my experience last year 
uh, working with ERC on Pangolin reports. So uh, our main uh, idea was to try to uh, track the routine to, to China, because China is a main consumer country. So uh, I've been uh, traveling in Vietnam, Myanmar, and of course in China. Uh, the main finding about uh, uh, in Vietnam is that uh, the very famous uh, smuggling line uh, between Mong Gai and, and Guangxi is still very active, even though it's already been be reported for many times and years. And in Myanmar, we found that in big cities, small cities, border cities, we can find pangolin skills or pangolins, alive pangolin, very easily. Compared with Vietnam, it's much easier. And also, we've been uh, looking into a very special case in China that uh, the, in the crime gang, the, the main a criminal was a Malaysian nationality, and he was sent to a lifetime imprisonment. So uh, it's very rare in China. The case is uh, about China, Hong Kong, and Malaysia. I think we have something already published on this uh, case. Um, so uh, I will go to next page. To uh, um, yes, this is about uh, Vietnam. That uh, there's a very, very, very famous smuggling route here. It's in the city of. Uh, a Mangai and the city of Guangxi named Dongxing, they're just across the river, you can see in the left picture. And we've talking with local people, like taxi drivers, they can show us the picture and they said they can deliver to China. But the, in China, the transport will be a bit harder. Also, uh, I've been to, to in an, another city, talk with a Chinese dealer, a Chinese people who live in, in, Viet, in Vietnam uh, for, for years and he is doing also uh, pangolin skills arrays. And he said it's also durable and from the same uh, routine from Mangai to Dongxing. Uh, even though on, on China side, it already set up the war, glass wall and the civilians cameras, but it's still going. Local people still have ways to transfer stuff into China. So uh, can we go to the next page? Yeah. This is what we do in Myanmar with our partner, uh, Ting uh, from Myanmar now, the, the reporters. We've been traveled to four or five cities. Uh, one of them in, is called named Dachili, is in the center of the triangle. I am a Chinese buyer, I'm very easy to find a live pangolin, as you see in the videos, uh, to buy. And this is from the, uh, uh, a city named uh, Miawadi. It's a city border with Thai, and it's a Chinese compound city with a lot of Chinese casino stuff. And there's a Chinese gift shop. They're selling pangolin like that. And we've been to Mandalay, a Chinese, a city famous of, with a lot of Chinese, uh, Chinese Ch Myanmar Chinese and all Chinese people living there doing jade business. They're selling that, uh, we, we found that uh, with people introduced. And in Yangguang, the biggest city in Myanmar, we found a live pang pangolin serve uh, just near the airport and pangolin skills also just near the airport by our Chinese owners. So the situation was much more severe than we expected in Myanmar. Because in, in Vietnam, it's quite, people are quite sensitive about talking about uh, pangolin skills to strangers. But in Myanmar, it's quite easy. Also, our reporter have been to the border city with China. It's also very easy to, to get with the military control area. So, uh, like the title said, pangolin uh, traffic in plain sight in Myanmar. Also in China, next page, please. Also in China, um, uh, me and Karen, we've, we've done some report, undercover report. You can see some numbers. It, this is the numbers be, before COVID, that, uh, before everything, China lift up pangolins stuff. And you can see uh, both legal label and not legal label products were very easy to find. The four pictures uh, there, the only left three one was uh, labeled with, with a legal label. Others, the first one was from internet. Others from medical shop in Guangdong and Guangxi. They're just showing up and without the uh, label. So uh, that's one big question. And uh, we've been to, a, to a, a medical factory in Guangdong also. The only one case, one time case, they're producing pangolin skills are very huge. So the national stockpile system that was only 25 tons will looks very 
uh, suspicious to us. And also, I, uh, I, I've seen a bunch of pangolin that, that smuggling from Vietnam to China. That has been tested by Chinese scientists that uh, they have related with COVID-19. That is uh, the same bunch I have seen. I think like, uh, like uh, 100 or 200 people have seen them. Uh, but we're we're okay. But uh, uh, so you know, as as you all know, the COVID make pangolin very hot topic here. So uh, we it's a lot of things we can talk about later. So also me and Karen, we we've done something uh, undercover in 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 a in a medical shop. In the next video, you can see, and I will pass to Karen. Thank you. <laughs> as Jamming mentioned, in China, pangolin scales for TCM use are only legal with government-issued special marks. But uh, as the video showed, it was one of the TCM shops, especially in smaller cities in China, that sell pangolin scales from unknown sources secretly at a cheaper price. So uh, here again, you see this uh, another photo. This one and the other uh, yellow crispy pieces you just saw in that video are all pangolin scales. I don't know when you look at this, how do you feel? I think for many people, when they look at this, especially for the same, the first time, you may not feel anything because it doesn't connect like them. You, you, it's very hard to connect them with the lively uh, and cute pangolins just next to me. And, um, but as you can see, pangolins are covered with uh, scales, which offer them protection. And so to take the scales from them, usually they are killed and uh, the scales are removed from their bodies. So next slide. So you can see here are bags and bags of raw scales from pangolins. And it was a seizure from uh, in Singapore last year and actually a total of more than 24 tons of scales in two shipments were seized in five days and how many pangolins you may ask the estimate is around 30,000 next slide and here again you can see some of the photos including the soup showed in the first video uh, it was, I, I need to clarify that it, it was a traditional TCM way to uh, tell people how to uh, use the pangolin soup for lactation, but uh, it's not that mainstream in terms of everybody's daily life. Um, and you can see other forms of products of pangolin scales, which were processed. And uh, Dr. Kong will talk about it in detail. So I just skip it. And next slide. So the two uh, shipments of pangolin scales seized in Singapore that I showed earlier were from Africa. And because of the massive poaching, pangolins in Asia has been, uh, became critically endangered. So smugglers switched to African scales for more than 10 years ago, especially in West Africa, like Cameroon, where pan African pangolins live. Traditionally, local people there had the habit of consuming pangolins as bush meat, together with other wildlife, as you can see in the photos. But the consumption was relatively small and the scales were usually discarded. 
But as the smugglers came to Africa to purchase the scales, they became valuable. The commercialization of the scales has driven the further poaching of the pangolins here, there. And uh, our collective member, Anupur, editor of Green Echoes, visited many rural areas in Cameroon, talking to pangolin traders and poachers to cover the illicit trade. Unfortunately, he passed away last year. I just want to pay tribute to him here. Next. And here are the photos that I took when I was posing as a buyer dealing with pangolin traders in South Africa, Johannesburg, uh, three years ago. Actually, uh, there was one ivory dealer that I talked to in a souvenir market. market. He happened to be a uh, pangolin dealer too. So he asked me to show up and show me some pangolin scales the next day, as you can see in the uh, bottom so that was the first time that I actually felt that I was touching an animal because the scales he showed me was like so big. African pangolins were like larger uh, uh, in terms of some species, not all. And uh, they still have some bones attached to the scales. Next. And it is not easy to investigate into the shipment smugglings because most of the time it just stopped at the seizure part. In Hong Kong, no culprits were found in the pangolin-related shipment seizures. Thanks to EIA's brilliant investigation into the ivory gang in China and the court documents, me and Jamin were able to follow up and piece together a relatively complete picture of how specifically a syndicate smuggled pangolin scales from Africa to China through different transits like Hong Kong to invade to evade inspection. Uh, next. So you can see in the graphic on the right, it was a very well-planned scheme of smuggling pangolins. And there was a Hong Kong businessman running a plastic factory in mainland China. And he was the key person who take care of all the logistics and used his factory as a cover to smuggle in pangolin scales and ivories from Africa into China. And that person is still at large. He's on Interpol Red Notice, wanted by the Chinese government for smuggling protected species and products. That's all, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jamming and Karen. Uh, brilliant work from you guys. Uh, and I think we, ha we do have quite a few questions. Uh, Sam, any questions that we, we would like to bring up? Uh, there is one from Kieran. Did you find any evidence of transit via Cambodia? Uh, is it a big transit hub for other wildlife? And also one from Muna. Would you say that a legal sale actually provides an avenue for illicit sale to continue? Okay, shall we take those two first? Uh, uh, Jamming and Karen, maybe the first one. Did you find evidence of transit via Cambodia? Not really. We found that uh, in a uh, in court case that uh, with evidence, but I think. With long border with China, I think there must be some something happening there. Yeah. Okay. And the other question was, sorry, Sam, can you repeat the other question from Muna? Uh, um, Muna's question to Karen is: Would you say that the illegal sale that that the legal sale actually provides an avenue for illicit sale to continue? Um, I think the legal sale, uh, the actual enforcement has um, made the illegal uh, selling a lot of possibilities because uh, like the ivories, uh, it's very easy to like just mix them among the legal scales. And you have really have to do those scientific testing or to get all the documents to show that they are illegal. So a lot of the time, it's very hard to tell them from the uh, legal scales. Mm. Uh, I see a question from Zi Yun as well, Zi Yun Lim. How does Singapore come into the picture in, in regards to trafficking? Any Singapore has a, a lot of seizures as, as, a, transport, as a transit point to, uh, to China, to elsewhere. They what, why is very, that, very large. What, why is it? Why why does Singapore have such a large amount though? Why why Singapore? Well, actually, that's something I also want to find out. 
Um, uh, because in our story, uh, also the EIA uh, reports, they found actually smugglers, especially syndicates, they have their own, uh, le- the, the routes, they own the smuggling route. That means those people, they have their networks, so they will use their people they know to help them to smuggle. So it might be, I, I don't know, like Singapore, they have somebody they knew can help them with the logistics. and. Uh, there was uh, also Busan in Korea. That was uh, a port that the smuggler used frequently for the ivories and uh, pangolin scales smuggling. Okay, so it's it's all about opportunity, right? In, in, if, if I understand you correctly, if you know somebody there who is willing to facilitate the logistics, you go to Singapore. If that closes down, you move, you find another route, and you find another route. So today it might be Singapore, or maybe. For, for a few months, it might have been Singapore, and if that gets shut down, they go somewhere else. Because there was there was some cases in Sabah, for example, as well, right? Some huge shipments in Sabah, for example, as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. Um, I don't know for sure, but uh, definitely lo- uh, logistics and the route is the key key point for smugglers to consider when they are doing this kind of thing. Okay, fantastic. Ian, we have right. a couple of raised hands. Maybe we can take uh, maybe we can take one question from someone. Yeah, I think we have quite a few hands raised, but I think some of these were from before. Any of you who have your hands raised and want to ask a question now, you, you can feel free, unmute yourself and, uh, and ask us your question. Thank you. First, just an, an observation that uh, the, the shift of traffic from Singapore back and forth, like between Singapore, Malaysia and other ports is all, was also very common with ivory. So it's a similar pattern, I think, for wildlife trafficking in general. The question I was going to ask is, I, we know with uh, some substances like, uh, for instance, rhinoceros, horn, or, excuse me, helmeted hornbill casks and ivory and other things, that these may not actually be shipped directly to China, but they will go to border markets uh, in Vietnam and, and, and Myanmar, places like that. And then Chinese purchasers will cross over from China into these countries to purchase them because that avoids some of the enforcement things going on within China. I mean, with with Hornbill Ivory, it was actually that the ivory was shipped to China, carved there, and then sent back over out of China to be sold in these border markets. I'm wondering if the same sort of thing is happening with pangolins. Thank you so much for for that insight, Ronald. Uh, Hopefully, we'll be able to discuss that uh, a bit more further down the line. Uh, We'd like to move on to our next uh, expert for now. Uh, We have Dr. Kong Wai Hong. Um, and he is going to explain to us a bit more uh, about how TCM works. And he also has a very unique perspective on uh, what he thinks is the future for TCM with regards to the use of pangolin skills. So Dr. Kong, uh, over to you. Good evening to everyone. I would like to do the brief, very brief introduction of TCM and the practice in Malaysia. Next slide, please. So uh, traditional uh, form of the medicine has been used in China since the third century. The TCM system consists of three parts, theory, treatments, and prevention. Okay, next slide. So basically the theory uh, is based on the like Taoism and some Chinese philosophy and some uh, culture. Uh, basically it's um, yin and yang. I think everyone Yin and Yang is uh, so the traditional uh, revolve around the principle of Yin and Yang, which are opposite found in the everything such as day and night, female and male, plus and minus. Yeah. So practitioner believe that every person have the life force known as Qi. So uh, Qi uh, similar as like internal force. Yeah. The purpose of medicine is to establish a balance of the body Qi. Uh, so our aim of the therapy uh, treatments is to balance our body, chi and blood circulation, etc. Next, sec- next slide, please. Chinese herbal medicine uh, has been used by Chinese people to treat disease for over 4,000 years. Herbs consist mainly of the natural medicinal materials such as plants. Mostly is plant. About 80% of the Chinese medicine is are consisted uh, by plants and animal parts, some of it, and mineral as well. So each ingredient has unique characteristics. The ingredients work in harmony to help a person's body. It's believed to, the herbs can boost qi and balance yin and yang. 
Next, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the, the TCM, okay. Basically, uh, most of the herbs and uh, because most of the herbs is come from plants, so because uh, it's also uh, uh, is our ch uh, Chinese philosophy uh, culture part of it, and that's why food of the Chinese food and the herbal medicine always sometimes mix mix together. You can, uh, for example, in like Hong Kong or Guangzhou, southern China. Uh, they like to uh, drink soup, yeah, uh, like chicken soup or whatever kind of soup. They normally they mix with some herbal medicine. So that's why herbal medicine can be used as a food supplement or treatment. Next, please. Uh, nowadays, uh, everything uh, uh, already involves science. So even the herbal medicine can process or and uh, manufacturer as a pill or capsule or even the uh, or even injection even the herbal injection have you about it uh, we can even do intravenous iv herbal medicine uh, you, you can see in the hospital <laughs> okay next next please next slide uh, okay so 1, 000, uh, 13,000 medicinal use in China, and then uh, about 100,000 medicinal recipe record in the ancient literature. The recipe means it's a combo. Uh, it's a comb combination of several types of herbs, uh, including some animals or plant or mineral together to uh, become a recipe. So there are 100,000 recipe. In the ancient literature. So plant elements and extract are by far the most common elements used. So in the classic of handbooks of traditional drugs from uh, 1941, 517 drugs were listed out of this uh, and only 45 were animal parts and 30 were minerals. And some animal parts used as medicinal such as cow ghost, uh, ghost stone, yeah? even the uh, bear ghost stone as well and rhino horns, etc. So the classic material medical Ben Chao Gang Mu uh, described the use of the 35 traditional Chinese medicine derived from the human body, including bones, fingernails, hair, dandruff, hair wax, <laughs> okay, impurity of the teeth, feces, urine, sweat, and organs as well. But most are no longer used uh, in nowadays. Yeah. Okay. So now I just share some uh, some uh, theory of uh, pancreas skills in uh, TCM. So basically, it's processed to uh, some in many ways. Some some can be dry, uh, burn it, roast it, fry it with vinegar, and become and crunch it to become a powder and uh, put into the capsule, uh, etc. And it tastes like salty taste and slightly cold. Cold means is a uh, it has the uh, cold therapeutic effects. Means uh, normally when our body have some heat, uh, for example, like kabankos, inflammation uh, nodules. So normally heat and inflammation process cause a redness. Uh, we classify it as cold, uh, hot, heat. So normally we use some cold uh, herbals or some uh, like pangolin skill to cool down. So in order to reduce the uh, swelling and the information process. So the meridian, uh, it will go through the liver meridian and stomach meridian. And they function to improve the blood circulation, dispel swelling, uh, and also re uh, reduce the breast nodules, carbuncles, and most to cure the uh, blood stasis, uh, the stagnation of the blood and anorea, nematism, breast milk, lactation, and scrotum. So the modern pharmacological research suggests it has the effect of anticoagulation, uh, reducing the blood viscosity, antimicrobial hypoxia, and increasing the white blood cells. So the usage normally we use uh, uh, orally, like in top uh, decoction, normally three to nine gram uh, or three to nine gram into the recipe, uh, and sometimes uh, in powder form. 
So external use dressing, like for the kabankas dressing. But of course, Bangladesh skill also have its uh, contraindication, especially for those people have weakness of chi and blood or disruption of the ulcer, pregnant women are prohibited. Next. So this, uh, I'm going to show some law of Malaysia. I'm come from Malaysia, so uh, we have uh, the law of Malaysia uh, of the international trade in endangered species. So the Bengalian, Bengalian, Bengalian is also uh, part of it. Yeah. Okay, next. Those who uh, really offense, uh, he can be fined not exceeding 100,000 ringgit or to imprison for terms not exceeding seven years or to both. Next. So uh, my personal uh, uh, ideas of action to protect endangered species, not only pangolin, uh, etc., panda, etc. Of course, first must learn about the endangered species in our area. Uh, when you know more detail, you will love it more, love the animal more. Yeah. Never purchase products made from the endangered species, and report any harassment of the treat, uh, threatened and endangered species. So you, we have to dare to report. Yeah, sometimes some some people not. So and be vocal and write to uh, your local newspaper urging support and of conservation. Ask your elected uh, representative to support the endangered species. Like for example, uh, we meet up today. Uh, this that is the purpose. Yeah, next. So join others in the annual stop intention challenge. Okay. Next, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kong. Uh, there are a lot of questions for you. Uh, Samantha, do you want to pick out a few? Uh, yes, uh, from Alexis. Uh, Alexis has asked many questions. Alexis, do you want to pick uh, maybe one or two questions to ask specifically to Dr. Kong? Um, hi, uh, uh, good afternoon from South Africa, Dr. Kong. First of all, you know, the use of African pangolin scales in Chinese traditional medicine, is this uh, legitimate um, according to you and in terms of the efficacy? Uh, you know, also, um, you know, you seem, you seem quite, um, you know, obviously dedicated to Chinese traditional medicine and authoritative on the, on, on the cures. I mean, have you, do you have direct, um, uh, 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 you know, sense of pangolin scales working as a cure? And I see other people have asked that if it's keratin, which is just fingernails, then how can it be effective in, in, in um, you know, in, 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 a, in a medicinal cure? How can it be effective? Okay. Uh, because Chinese medicine has been practiced by Chinese people, uh, not only Chinese people, I mean, uh, for many, many thousand years, uh, we can't deny the effectiveness of the certain products or certain, uh, like, uh, include uh, pangolin scale. But the thing is, uh, there are many alternative ways now. Because I think why we gather today is because of the extinction, extinction of the pangolin. If let's say pangolin is not going to extinct today or in some few years, I think we won't together sit here. Yeah. Uh, but, but of course, because of extinction of these uh, species. So uh, my personal view, uh, there are many, many uh, alternative. Even uh, there are uh, even nowadays uh, there is a, a research proof that. Trotters, you know, trotters, that is a fingernails of the pig can, can replace and have the similar effects of uh, pangolin skill. So that's why I think we can, uh, we can uh, uh, replace pangolin skill by trotters. I mean, of course, we, a lot of people eat pork today. The, the, <laughs> the pig nail, fingernail <laughs> can be, uh, can be used it. But of course, as a personal feel, uh, nowadays we can't deny human is the biggest enemies 
for the biodiversity. I think uh, we we must think from both sides. Of course, if let's say the tankering skill have no effective, uh, no, no therapeutic effect, there will not, there will have no anybody will want to try it. But of course, nowadays I think the pro, the main problem is the curiosity, the greedy of the human being. I think so. As a person, uh, as a doctors or TCM practitioner, I personally never use it. I have so many ways to cure kapankos uh, and even for uh, breast relaxation. There are so many ways why we should use a uh, pangolin scale. Thank you. And, and, and just before you carry on, uh, Dr. Kong, the use of African pangolin scales in Chinese traditional medicine, how do you, uh, you know, how do you feel about that? Do you think that any pangolin scales can be used and, and what is the, you know, what are the traditions around Chinese pangolins specifically? I have no experience uh, uh, in, uh, so how so called, I never use it. That's why I have uh, no idea what kind of difference. Because most of the, uh, most of the pangolin skill, they have already, uh, they sell in the market in China. Of course, that is illegal. I never use it. I even, even in uh, processed food, Products I never use it. That's why I I can't comment this at all. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Alexis uh, and Dr. Kong. Uh, Sam, are there any other questions? Uh, there is one uh, from Aisha. Uh, is there a division within TCM between practitioners who insist on using the original materials versus those who want to find alternatives to endangered species? It's come to individual. Uh, some people still stubborn. They want to use it. You can't. But of course, the law in China, even in Malaysia, has been banned it. So those who want to use it, they, they want to take their risk, their own risk. That's up to them. But I think, uh, first, firstly, I myself, I never use even my association member. I am the general secretary of TCM Malaysia, uh, I can assure you Malaysia TCM practitioner, uh, uh, we won't use it. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kong. I'm sure there'll be many more questions that we can bring up later, but, but we'd like to move along uh, so that our last expert will be able to speak. And then after that, we'll have a like wide open Q&A where we can just all have a nice big conversation. I would like to introduce all of you to Chris Ham, uh, Hamley. So clearly, uh, Chris, TCM is not just uh, an educated superstition, which, which a lot of people seem to have that, that perception. It is based on a lot of knowledge that's been passed down over thousands of years. And as uh, Dr. Kong mentioned earlier, there is research and certification involved. However, the one thing that we can't deny is that it does have an effect on the wildlife trade. So to talk a bit more about this, we have Chris, who's a senior pangolin campaigner for the Environmental Investigative Agency, which is an organization that investigates uh, environmental crimes such as wildlife smuggling. So over to you, Chris. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so as we've been discussing, we know that the uh, consumption of traditional Chinese medicine, also known as TCM, particularly in China, is a major driving factor in the global illegal wildlife trade. And the pangolin is experiencing a very high level of transnational trafficking currently. Um, so addressing issues with demand for pangolin scales in China is a key priority if we end this transnational trade. So today I'm just gonna give a brief presentation um, on the legal framework in China as it relates to wildlife and give a case study of um, pangolins. So next slide, please. So um, China has a wildlife protection law that was most recently published in 2017. It is the most recent um, significant piece of legislation covering the conservation and use of uh, terrestrial wild animals. Um, and it is mostly concerned with protected species and delineates different levels of protection. Um, for instance, there are both first and second class protected species. 
um, with the first class receiving a higher level of protection. However, the law has various exemptions that allow for the commercial utilization of wildlife, in particular Article 27, which allows even protected species to be used in traditional Chinese medicine. Next slide, please. So when we look specifically at pangolins, um, around the year 2007, the Chinese government issued um, a number of notices outlining how uh, pharmaceutical companies and hospitals in China could legally use pangolins from a national stockpile. So they're only able to use, legally use, scales from this national stockpile. And any scales that were used in the medicines produced by pharmaceutical companies were required to carry um, a special sticker or mark, um, which was or is regulated under the China National Wildlife Mark Scheme. Um, between 2008 and 2014, the Chinese government um, approved the use of around 186 tons of pangolin scales from the national stockpile. Um, now, from around 2014, we do not have any up-to-date data and information on the quantity of pangolin scales that have been issued through quotas. Um, however, we do know that pharmaceutical companies continue to produce um, various patented um, formulae that contain pangolin scales. Next slide, please. Um, there are various issues with this legal market for pangolin scales. Um, the system lacks a clear chain of custody, meaning that there is little verification of the sources of scales. And this means the system is exceptionally vulnerable to the potentially laundering of illegally sourced pangolin scales. Um, and the maintenance of this legal market by the Chinese government legitimizes the use of pangolin scales and stimulates demand uh, within China for the use of this globally threatened species. Next slide, please. Now, while uh, China has been maintaining this legal market, we have seen an endless number of exceptionally large pangolin scale seizures across Africa, uh, South and Southeast Asia. Uh, over the, particularly the last five years. Um, however, you know, the trade has been going on for many decades, um, but only now is receiving the attention it should be. Um, and the key point here is that uh, many of these pangolin scale shipments are destined for China, and they're destined for use in China's TCM market. And the legal market in China is essentially performing a cover for this uh, transnational trafficking. Next slide, please. So many of you may have seen the uh, recent news um, about almost a month ago now in the international media that China had removed pangolin uh, from the TCM pharmacopoeia um, and that it had implemented a ban on the use of pangolin scales. When this news uh, hit the headlines, EIA was um, particularly skeptical of it um, because we had seen a similar situation before with uh, leopard bone. Um, and actually, when we were able to obtain a copy of the 2020 edition of the TCM Pharmacopoeia, we found that while pangolin scale had been removed as a key raw ingredient in the Pharmacopoeia, it actually remained in a number of um, patented formulae. Um, so actually, the legal market for pangolin scales in China still remains and very little has changed um, regarding their use in TCM. Uh, next slide, please. So within China, um, there has long been uh, a range of voices that have been calling for greater restrictions on the wildlife trade and a shift to a less consumptive approach 
to um, wildlife conservation. In particular, since the start of the year and the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been further calls from Chinese academics and NGOs to extend bans to traditional Chinese medicine. Um, however, we recognize that the majority of TCM does not contain any wildlife parts. Um, and many within the TCM industry, such as Dr. Kong, are calling for change. Thank you. We, we, um, EIA are doing significant research and monitoring into the transnational trafficking of pangolin scales. So I'm happy to answer questions about that as well, in addition to the um, China legal market. Fantastic. Um, I think there were a few questions early on that would have been directed to you about the trafficking trade. Uh, I'm so sorry, I, I don't think I'll be able to find them quick enough. So if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hands and uh, we'll get to them. All right, we'll just give it a few seconds. Anybody want to raise your hands? In the meantime, maybe I'll take a couple of questions from earlier on that were for Dr. Kong and we'll get back to questions from Chris. So feel free to raise your hands and figure out that button while you're while we're doing this. Uh, we have a question from Zi Yun Lim. Uh, and I assume this is for Dr. Kong. Is use of wildlife parts encouraged or taught in TCM school? Dr. Kong? We, uh, we, that is taught in uh, school, but uh, just because that is part of the TCM uh, herbal medicine, uh, I mean, Chinese medicine. It has been taught, yes. But okay. actually, uh, in ancient uh, times, there is very rare uh, using pangolin skill in the ancient recipe, TCM and recipe. I think the, uh, I think it's getting more and more in the reason, uh, new century, it means 20th century. Okay. So yes, it's, it's more and more yeah. 20th century. Okay. So it's a fairly new development. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think a few people are asking this as well, so thank you for answering that. Uh, we have uh, Alex Denton, you have your hand raised. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Hi, uh, yeah, just a message for Chris um, regarding the, uh, the news this year for, about the pharmacopoeia. So, um, yeah, I was just a bit confused because I saw the news as well and was quite skeptical. Um, so when it says that pangolin scales are removed as a raw material, but they're still allowed to be used in patented medicines that are mass manufactured. What, what's the difference between what goes into those medicines and the raw pangolin scales? Yeah, so the, the raw, <laughs> this is a little bit of an ambiguous situation. Um, so in some of the video actually that we saw from Karen earlier, there were some images of sort of processed pangolin scales being sold. Um, and my understanding is they're termed yin pian, and, and actually in China, the sale of those um, products um, is restricted to uh, pharmaceutical companies. So the sale in um, a pharmacy would definitely be illegal. Um, now, our interpretation is that there will continue to be um, a lack of availability of the raw scales in those sorts of points of sale. Um, and the fact that it remains in the patent section um, will contribute to maintaining this legal market. And in addition to the, the eight that were in the pharmacopoeia, there's also about 70 other patented medicines that are in other um, nationally approved lists. And we have currently identified about 36 that are actively for sale within China. Um, so in terms of the impact that it would have on the use of pangolin scales, it is likely to be quite minimal. Right, okay, thank you. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Ronald, do you have a question as well? Uh, Ronald Orenstein, can you please feel free to unmute yourself? Oh, yes. No, it's just a reminder of the question I asked earlier. I wonder if Chris knew anything about whether there was much sale of pangolin products in uh, border markets uh, over the border from China to uh, to Chinese customers. I just also maybe add 
whether there have been uh, any tests to show whether the medicines claiming to contain pangolin scales actually do. Thank you. Um, we have picked up um, specifically the online sale of pangolin products across, across Southeast Asia in smaller quantities than what you see in China. Uh, we also see the large consignments of pangolin scales that are entering Southeast Asia from Africa being broken up into much smaller shipments in countries such as Vietnam for onward distribution to China. Um, and the, the second question, sorry, was on... Whether, I know with rhinoceros horn, it's been reported that a lot of the so-called horn on sale is actually a, a fake, it's water buffalo or something. And whether that's, uh, has anybody analyzed these patent medicines made from pangolin scales to show if they actually do contain pangolin? That's not, um, I'm not sure of that, but not something that we have worked on. Um, can I follow up a bit on these questions? Yeah. Uh, from my experience in, in, in Myanmar, that uh, Myanmar and China has a lot of uh, borders that are controlled by militaries. That is very famous, bad fame of uh, smuggling and everything. Um, actually, on, 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 from our investigation on, on Chinese side, they are take quite serious about uh, these areas. So that might be a little bit harder than before. But also uh, we found that in Myanmar and China, the people are using uh, logistic companies, not legal companies, that's through very big customer between Myanmar and China. Um, but uh, the problem they say that uh, the transform in, inside China was hard for them because there's uh, those cities across border like Yunnan or Guangxi, uh, they are so famous for smuggling. So they have bordered, they have checkpoint uh, from its borders is to, to like to Kunming, and then out of Yunnan, they have another checkpoint. So inside transfer will be a little bit hard, but they are using like the very big uh, logistic company. I think that's uh, something new uh, in our investigation. Yeah. Um, I also have one point to make. Can I? Sure. Um, regarding Ronald's question about the pangolin uh, products, if they are uh, fake or not, uh, I think for some of the online sales, especially the online ones, uh, actually you can see from the materials, the quality, uh, they, some of them do not look like the authentic pangolin scales. Uh, and I visited one uh, drugstore in Hong Kong. A very few uh, drugstore in Hong Kong sell uh, pangolin scales, according to based on my uh, undercover visits. But there was one, and uh, I saw the pangolin scales. Uh, it was processed and covered with like sugar-like uh, stuff, which uh, does not like what I saw earlier. So uh, I think there were a lot of also like fake products mixed in. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Uh, we also just would like to address a point from Corin uh, really quickly, Corin Jones, uh, who was asking about whether there was any attempts to uh, farm uh, pangolins at a in a commercial scale, uh, pardon the pun, <laughs> in order to uh, to increase the population and and to meet the demand. And we actually addressed this in a couple of study groups ago. Uh, and we, I think the consensus among all the experts was that this, it was just not viable for many, many reasons. And I think uh, Dr. Chong Julian, who is here with us, was the expert at the time. She gave a, a list, uh, there's like a checklist of 17 different criteria that you should, that uh, we, you have to, to, to kind of fulfill in order to consider captive breeding of a particular, uh, or commercial breeding of a particular animal. And uh, it, we, there's just no way to justify a pangolin breeding uh, based on that. Yeah, so I hope that answers that question. We also have a hand raised from Sally Jensen. Can you please take, uh, yeah, feel free to ask your question. Go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks so much uh, for the really interesting presentations. Um, I just wanted to, I, I think Aisha asked this previously as well, um, but has, the, has there been an increase in the number of pangolins uh, scales being seized or is it um, 
is it just better enforcement of laws and policing and kind of related to this if there has been an increase uh, who who mostly is the biggest market in China is it kind of older the older generation or is it uh, a young people also uh, interested in purchasing these pangolin scales and other other endangered species I think this is a kind of a two-parter. I think Chris can answer a bit of that. And Dr. Kong can take the part about whether younger generations are also, uh, yeah, using this. Yeah. yeah, so in terms of seizures, um, so EIA has been um, monitoring pangolin scale seizures over the, the course of about 15, 20 years. And during that period, we've seen a definite increase in the frequency and volume of pangolin scale seized. However, um, there is one, yes, more law enforcement intention on pangolin scales currently. So likely there are more seizures happening um, and there's more attention on pangolins generally. So therefore there's more public reporting of the seizures. Um, if you do look back into some of the trade data and even just looking at the fact that you know, the four Asian pangolin species are heavily depleted over, you know, the latter course of the last century into the start of this century, there was undoubtedly significant volumes of pangolin scale trafficking within Asia going on, although it wasn't being reported in the media. Um, the difference now, and this was mentioned by uh, Jai Ming and Karen, that there has been this massive shift of sourcing of pangolin scales from Southeast Asia to Africa, starting from about 2008, but then really kicking off from 2013-15. Um, now to the point where you know significant volumes are being sourced, particularly from across West and Central Africa. Um, so we can expect there to be a major impact on the pangolin populations in those two regions currently. Um, and also something else is that while pangolin scales are being used in TCM, the larger pangolin scales um, are actually also being diverted into the ornament trade and used as jewelry. Um, and larger scales might um, command a higher price on the market. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Dr. Kong, I think the, there was a, another part of that question about the younger generation and uh, what are their perception towards pangolin skills and, and TCM. Basically, uh, young generation prefer Western medicine more than TCM. But uh, of course, if let's say the uh, youngest generation want to use TCM herbal medicine, I mean, I mean uh, Chinese medicine, normally they use it uh, in capsule form or pill form. So normally all this process, uh, I mean the ready-made uh, herbal medicine, normally register under the Minister of Health. In Malaysia, normally Malaysia, uh, Minister of Health is not, I mean, not allowed those uh, herbal medicine with the instinct animal or endangerment animal at all. But of course, even but I mean, in China, but of course, uh, maybe some of it in hospital, but nowadays, uh, I seldom see anybody use it in, even in a big hospital, even in China. Okay, thank you. We also have a question from Astrid, Astrid Anderson. Hi. 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 And uh, hi, Karen. Oh God, I look awful. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about the COVID related wildlife trade restrictions that have been happening in China and how this has affected stuff like pangolin farming. I don't know if there's been any specific information on that or if you know. All right, thanks for that. Chris? I can, I can give it a shot. Um, so as far as I'm aware, the, um, you know, the initial response from the Chinese government was on uh, preventing the consumption of wildlife as food, um, not as medicine. So even though you know, there's been this suspected link between pangolins and coronaviruses, and 
while you know the, the debate is still or the science is still unanswered on whether pangolins played a role in the emergence of COVID-19, pangolins do carry coronaviruses. Um, so you'd have thought that there'd also be a risk in um, allowing pangolins to be consumed um, in terms of you know the butchering and transportation and handling of pangolins. And then on the captive breeding side, well, actually the other day, the uh, National Forest and Grassland Administration published a new notice on pangolin protection and regulation. And in that notice, it um, mentioned the strengthening of regulation and controls relating to captive breeding of pangolins and is, and is still promoting research into the captive breeding of pangolins as a sort of viable option to develop um, the supply of pangolin scales on a commercial basis, despite all the scientific evidence suggesting um, actually the commercial use of um, you know, farming of pangolins is unviable. Hope that answers some of the questions. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Tessa Ullman. Uh, would you like to ask your question, Tessa? Oh, yes, sorry. I'm trying to unmute no. there. Um, earlier, um, Dr. Kong, during your presentation, you mentioned alternatives, which I'd also seen the uh, the alternative ingredient of trotters being proposed. So my question being um, specific to pangolin scales, but also in general, how likely do you think users are to uh, switching to proposed alternatives? Uh, Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, my personal view, most of us, I mean, TCM practitioner in Malaysia, is, uh, uh, we, we prefer to use alternative rather than all these uh, animals products, animal uh, medicine part. Even like just now we talk about the, uh, the nylon horns, sometimes some uh, ready make Chinese medicine as uh, the rhino horn is replaced by the buffalo horn. Yeah. Uh, basically, in Malaysia, we we seldom or very, we can say we, we won't use uh, all this. Uh, we prefer alternative. We prefer herbal medicine. It's not animal part, especially in Chinese community. Most of uh, some of us are uh, vegetarian, and even Malaysia Muslim country. Uh, they, they need HALA certificate. So they, they prefer herbal, not animal parts of the uh, uh, Chinese medicine. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks for uh, <clears throat> On that note, I think we'd like to show something that we were able to produce a lot together with the uh, Environmental Reporting Collective. Sapa, can you yeah, sure, that's great. So at Rage, uh, after we did our investigations into the pangolin trafficking trade, and we realized just how rampant it was here, uh, we were thinking about how to uh, get people who are normally uh, use, those who use traditional Chinese medicine, how do we convince them to stop using it? Uh, instead of trying to just tell them that there is no scientific evidence that it works, and that, instead of that narrative, we decided to do uh, to explain to them what are the sustainable or plant-based alternatives. So if you check this out, I think Elroy just posted the link to this as well. You'll see that there are actually plenty of uh, recipes as mentioned by Dr. Kong that uh, plant-based, that, that uh, you do not need to use pangolins for that at all. So if you could share this, uh, that could be really helpful to all the people. And if you go to the website, uh, Sapal has just shared it in the chat as well, rage.com.my slash pangolin, you'll be able to see our full uh, illustrated story of the pangolin trafficking trade, uh, as well as this little recipe book there as well. Okay, uh, on that note, we also had a question earlier that I want to just quickly take uh, from Joan Rulin. Uh, on, this is more about consumer behavior. So it seems most people are aware that consumption poses a threat to endangered species, right? Consumption for TCM. So why are they still reluctant to use alternatives? Why is the why is the trade still so so vibrant? Uh, maybe Dr. Kong, you can take and take this question, and after the other experts can chime in as well. Why some people are still reluctant? Is it? Yeah. 
that, that behavior, the consumer behavior, why is it still hard? Why is it so hard to change? Demand and supply. <laughs> I think. Uh, uh, come back to my personal view is the curiosity, and uh, I mean some of the TCM practitioner maybe they insist to use Pangolin skill is because of the efficacy, but of course they they think that the uh, the 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 recipe itself uh, can, must be completely similar as ancient recipe, so they don't want to change it. So. So that's why maybe that is their individual ideas. So this may, uh, and then maybe it's because of nowadays, uh, economy, maybe uh, financially, uh, most of the people affordable. Yeah. And then maybe they, they just want to try other special. And then maybe sometimes it's because of even the alternative, uh, alternative herbal medicine or alternative uh, part of the Chinese medicine can't really help them. Then maybe they try alternative way, but the things is uh, can't help. So at the end, they will choose the, the, the ex exactly, I mean the real recipe. Uh, okay. Maybe. Okay. Maybe it's something that Jamming and, uh, and Karen might be able to help answer as well. Um, yeah, why why is it is it a status symbol, or is is that could that be part of the reason? Is it just because of the novelty of it? I, I think um, uh, I I heard from friend that uh, uh, some TCM doctors they, they would like to give that um, because that uh, the price of that was very high, so mm. uh, they they can maybe get profit from it and uh, they're persuading people to 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 see that uh, it is more strong maybe. To, to those people who need it. So, yeah. Okay. What do you think, Karen? How how can we, how can we change uh, this consumer behavior? What what what's causing it, and how can we possibly change it? What kind of messaging are we trying to put out there? I think that part is all still kind of a, a a puzzle for me to find out in terms of individual consumers, because uh, when I was doing uh, investigations. I saw people like selling the uh, pangolin meat as uh, bush meat and also some drug stores trying to sell the scales. But uh, I actually haven't been able to find like uh, individual consumers around us like who are interested in buying scales. A lot of maybe they're just young people so they are not that interested. But definitely we saw a lot of pharmaceutical companies they rely on like they have a lot of scales uh, production in terms of uh, TCM and uh, they sell those with the legal uh, certificates they can sell the skills at a very high price so I think that is a kind of like uh, a, a lot of profits for them but in terms of uh, individual uh, purchasing I'm actually quite optimistic because uh, uh, with this uh, a lot of news reporting and uh, the uh, our education, I believe like young people will be more and more aware of like the protection of the species. Yeah. All right, thank you for that. Chris, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I think the only thing potentially um, is, you know, there's a growing community in China um, recognizing the need for a shift away from the use of globally threatened wildlife in TCM. Um, I think that will play a big role um, in pushing for change within China. Um, also, you know, um, leadership and um, public statements from people such as Dr. Kong within China who do not support the use of globally threatened wildlife in TCM um, as a means through to, you know, to influence um, both other TCM practitioners and consumers of TCM. All right. Thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, I think uh, we're reaching almost to the end of our time. Uh, we've actually gone past time. Uh, so we're going to do a wrap up. And then after that, uh, feel free to stay back and continue all these discussions. Number one, we'd like to take a poll just to be able to get a gauge on how well this session has gone. Uh, and also just so we have some feedback 
to and how we can improve. So, uh, Satpal, are we ready with the poll? All right, there you go. Did you learn anything new through the session? Three, two, and one. Thank you. Yes. Also, we got a comment saying that it was the best Zoom production ever. So, well done. Ah, uh, thank you. All right, next question. How would you rate our wildlife study groups on Zoom as an educational tool for wildlife conservation? Uh, one would be absolutely useless. That would be very, very bad for us. Number five would be amazing. So, oh, okay. That's not too bad. Right. Great. The person who says absolutely useless, we are so sorry to have wasted your time. But we hope you got some value out of it either way. Yeah. Thanks uh, for joining. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for being back. Number three, uh, should traditional Chinese medicine uh, be? Uh, what, what do you think about the Chinese um, TCM regulations? Sorry. Okay, I think it's pretty much the same. Yeah. That it's good. Cool. Uh, that there should be struggle rules against the use of wildlife parks. Um, so. That is it from us. Uh, it's been an amazing uh, four weeks of uh, study groups with all of you. Thank you so much to all of you who came back uh, over and over. Uh, we really hope that you found this uh, helpful and that you'll continue to collaborate across all these different countries to uh, do the important work that you all do. So I hope we will continue to be in touch and uh, you continue to follow the work of the Environmental Reporting Collective. Yes, I'm trying so hard not to cry, Dr. Chow. Yes, this has been great. <laughs> so thank you once again and uh, hope we'll see you guys around. It's been a great four weeks. Can't we just stop it from the point of origin? Can we do that? I'm sure in Africa they had those laws. So how can you stop that from getting out of Africa? And how can we stop pangolins from getting out of Malaysia? Uh, those, those kinds of issues, probably it might save the pangolin a lot. I really appreciate that you guys have made this interactive. So many webinars we see, you can sit there and you can add chat, but this gives a chance for so many people with different areas of expertise to weigh in. So I greatly appreciate it. In fact, I'd like to know exactly how you set it up. <laughs>